Take a person, take a story, take you on a journey. It's your take. On today's Your Take, I'm joined by a woman who has a passion for one game, which has managed to turn into a profession and a business. My guest is a professional billiards player and fell in love with the game at 14 years of age. She's gone on to become an ambassador for the sport, playing in tournaments and exhibition matches around the world. Away from competition and the match table, my guest makes a living from teaching, selling pool cues, DVDs, chalk holders, accessories, and signed memorabilia. She's also a keen artist, and in a previous life, had a modeling career. Hot in the colors today is Mary Avina. We discuss Mary's love for billiards and turning her profession into a business opportunity, competitive matches and her fiercest opponents, a female perspective on the game, her plans for the future and her interests away from the table. A very warm welcome, Mary. Thank you kindly for joining us. I say this evening, but afternoon where you are, in Fort Worth, <laughs> Texas. Welcome to your take. Happy to be here. I'm looking forward to talking to you for a, a number of reasons. A first for us, you're the first sports personality that we've had on your take. I'm interested to hear about your love for the game and how you've managed to turn that into your profession and a, a business opportunity. But to start with, Mary, I wanted to go back, if I can, to the, the very beginning. You were born and raised in Southern California. I wanted to ask... Uh -huh. When were you born? And can you just give us the description of your upbringing and give us some background on your parents, what they did for a living, and if you have any siblings? Well, yes, I was born in Riverside, Southern California. It doesn't make the news often, but it's in Southern California. It was, it had its good areas and bad areas. And my mom was, my family. My mom, she was a genius that never accomplished anything. <laughs> a, cl a clever lady. She is literally a genius. She is that smart, but she's one of those people that never accomplished any of the things you would think someone with that IQ could. And my real dad, he was gifted, good looking, never accomplished anything. He drank himself to death. And I'm only anything because my stepdad. My stepdad was a businessman and everything I am comes from him really because sure. that's how I carry myself. He raised me to be a version of himself and that's the reason I'm successful in billiards where many of my counterparts aren't. It's because I look at billiards from the business point of view first. So I'm a lot more practical in my approaches. An interesting insight into your background, a, a brief brief insight into it. Mm -hmm. Would you say that your stepfather has been almost a real, you know, a real father to you? And would you say that he's been your mentor in life in, in many ways? Well, yes, he taught me the hard work with proper channeling of dedication. You can accomplish anything and there's no shortcuts. I, a lot of people, especially, I hate to say it, but in my generation, they want the fame, they want the success, and even going back to baby boomers, they want everything, but they don't necessarily want to do the work for it. And if you do the work for it, everything is actually fairly simple, you know? <laughs> We're obviously going to talk about your perseverance, hard work with you, which you've mentioned, and dedication, a can-do attitude to succeed in your mm -hmm. profession. But before we do so, I wanted to talk about schooling because I think it was a, a time in your life that you weren't particularly fond of. And I wanted to ask you why you kind of slowly fell out of love with your education 
but why you at that stage were particularly interested in the creative areas such as reading, drawing, and you also had um, a keen flair for, for artwork as well. Well, um, so I was an A student. I looked like I was gonna bound for any high level career that requires a college degree. But to me, that was very dull. So it was very, very dull. And part of the reason it was those because it came very easily to me. I did inherit my mother's, you know, abilities. So it was very, um, very dull from my point of view. As a matter of fact, when I was a kid, I thought I was going to be a scientist. <laughs> so, and my dad was pushing me to be a lawyer, obviously, my stepdad. So when I say my dad, I really mean my stepdad or a businessman, something business related. But the art is something different. That comes from my dad's side. They're, my dad's side, they're golden, they're gold jewelers. And it goes back several, at least three, four generations where you get the gift. And that's actually what anybody had the gift made a living at. So that was in me. So when I was a child, people would look at my artwork, my drawing, and from their point of view, I had already mastered art. And they were very mystified by the fact that I could draw realistically and I was a child. But to me, it was just like breathing. I also took that for granted, <laughs> to be honest, because it also came to me fairly easily. So later, as a matter of fact, my first website, my, web, my main website was only created to sell art originally. So I was, everyone bothered me, harassed me, because <laughs> I was already selling art in galleries for about $2,000 already. So they wanted me to make a website. So I actually only made a website at first to sell art. A shrewd businesswoman from a, a young age, a creative mm -hmm. flair and following in the, the footsteps of your mum in terms of academia and your, mm -hmm. your intellect, your IQ. I wanted to ask you, when you finished high school, did you go on to further education? And from a young age, did you have any particular early career aspirations? Well, I was already working by the time finishing high school in Moran. I had already been working for years. So I've been already modeling in LA. And also I've been making money from other sources. I had already had many jobs. So for me, it was... As a matter of fact, my stepdad disowned me around that time because I refused to go to college. <laughs> he had already laid out my life for me and that involved me going to college. So for, for a minute there, my stepdad disowned me because I actually refused to go to college because I was already, I was already on my way to, I, I could already beat the average person at pool, most on one hand. So I was, I was already busy working so I was not, to me, schooling, part of the problem with schooling, and I say that with a caveat, because since I have taken the route of many online classes, so I'm, now I'm certified on many things, and some of my classes come from Harvard, <laughs> the business school. <laughs> so since then, I have become certified in many things, some of them in person, some of them online. So I have gone martial arts degrees, I have gone a lot of NLP, certificates. I also have gone, I'm a master in NLP, which is more like practical psychiatry. I've also studied a lot of more practical stuff, business related stuff from Harvard Business School Online. So like accounting. So when I was about to, I do a lot of consulting. So I've actually studied quite a bit on the business side and I do mm -hmm. most of those classes online. I wanted to move on to your teenage years and pick up on your uh, modeling work and career. Uh, you started traveling to Los Angeles for modeling work. Yes. What kind of assignments and work were you involved in? And did you enjoy the experience? And what opportunities did it create? It's kind of a mixed bag. When I was a kid and people so unquote discover me, the common LA story for viewers that obviously aren't familiar with Southern California. Uh, Riverside is only 44 minutes from LA, but it's a completely different world. Riverside is a working class, you know, 
people don't make a lot of money. There's no models. It's, it's a complete separate world from Hollywood, even though it's only 44 minutes that way. So I was actually pretty deaf to the idea of modeling. People kept finding me in malls and giving me cards, and I was not interested. Hmm. Till they told, they kept trying to get me to go with it for the being famous part. That was horrifying to me. <laughs> um, it wasn't until finally a professional photographer, Italian photographer, who actually did my first headshots, told me how much they make. And by then, I had already worked real jobs. You know, like babysitting was my first real job. I've been doing that since I was hell, <laughs> since I was a kid. Sometimes babysitting children older than me because I was so responsible. So <laughs> when they told me how much a model makes, that's what got me to do it. So for me, it was purely monetary. Yeah. And I did, um, you know, print work, you know, and I actually got offered Hollywood work. So to be a, a travel girl. So, you know, some travel channel type of things like that. But I actually turned it down because... I didn't like being a tool, honestly. So I enjoy the confidence it gave me and I learned to take pictures as well. I learned about the business, the practical side, and I learned to take pictures on both sides, on one end and the other end, use the camera. You know, because when I was a kid, this, the iPhone wasn't great yet. <laughs> you still had to use real cameras, which people forget, you know, um, it wasn't that long ago. Funnily, remember the 35 millimeter cameras and processing the, the film. Um, we move on to, from a, a short term modeling career, and you've mentioned some of the other uh, jobs that you did during that time or previous to that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think we've lost your image. Oh, have you? Yeah. Is it back? Oh, that's better. Yeah, back again. Right. Huh, <laughs> <Go back. interesting. laughs> okay, well, so we are what... across the pond. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you've already spoken about your brief modeling career and some of the other jobs that you did around that time or previous to that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about the life changing moment when you fell in love with billiards when you were around 14 years old. Can you recall the first time you played the game? And um, what was it that made it so appealing, enjoyable, and the mo most important thing in your life? Well, the first time I played pool, I went into a bar. And for your viewers that don't, didn't meet me when I was that age, I look basically the same. So. I was, I have only grown one inch since then. I'm five, seven now, I was five, six. So I look basically the same, except I was on my modeling weight. So I was, I was there and I did not fall in love with drinking. I fell in love with pool. The first time I played, I lost very badly, by the way. <laughs> Some random guy beat me very easily. Well, and I was, there was something about the game that captured my imagination. I don't know if it was my autism, or my Asperger's, my obsession. It was, it, I say love, but most people would call it obsession. Mm. And to me, it just fulfilled so many of my, because it was so difficult. Well, it was so beautiful at the same time. There's something so magical about it that I cannot put into words. So I decided from the moment on that I was, I really did nothing else. <laughs> for the next four months, but play pool after that. Interestingly, I wanted to tap into this obsession and this <laughs> dedication and this, this love for what you do, because so many of us have, I guess, obsessions and things we're passionate about that we want to dedicate our lives <laughs> to that particular area or pursue a, a career in that particular vocation or profession or to learn a skill. I wanted to ask you how many hours you were spending per day perfecting your game and what age did you turn professional and were ent entering tournaments and actually earning money from the game? So at the beginning, I was doing seven hours 
pretty much every day, every other day, which was pretty difficult because I didn't have a car. I was not old enough to drive. And people that know Southern California, getting around is a lot harder in Southern California. It's not like New York or London where you can get people around. So I was walking everywhere with this obsession. And so, but within a year, I could beat most people easily. So I had nights, I show up seven hours, didn't lose a game, left at two in the morning, still had, had not lost the game. It's funny since I moved on to harder games because the bar box was not hard enough. And I was winning too much. You know, the old adage, if you're the best player in the room, you're probably in the wrong room. <laughs> and so I started making money right away. At first, you know, mostly just playing for money. So people would challenge me to money games. And I would win most all the time. Usually it was one game and it was over because of the time period I'm in. So I'm under 30. So money games are not as common as they once were. So most of the time I would once, win once and they would just stop. My first money game was literally $50 one game. And I played one handed and my opponent didn't. And I won super easily. There was no second game. <laughs> so I made money right away. And then I played a tournament here and there, but it wasn't that interesting to me. Um, I did make a little bit of money there, but it wasn't dramatically interesting to me. Uh, I started really getting interesting when I start, went to Cambria, where I used to play 10 by five snooker for money. There, I'm, I clocked over a thousand money games in just over a year. So that was fantastic. And that's now gone. <laughs> I wish I could do that again. And I guess in 2013, people started paying me for my trick shots because I'm, I'm the best female trick shot artist. Uh, they started paying me long before that. So, but in 2013 is when I made full money completely from, bill from billiards. I stopped selling art. I stopped doing any other kind of job. So it was 2013, so I would be about 20 years old. So that's about the time I became pro in practicality because I do nothing else after that. And I haven't done anything else since. If it's not pool related, I'm not doing it. <laughs> well, we'll turn the clock back to 2013 when you kind of said was the period where you turned professional. Mm -hmm. You've obviously managed to generate a business from your passion and love of playing billiards. How did you go about achieving this? Who helped you along the way? And can you discuss the avenues you've used to generate a sustainable living from obviously playing the game you love so much? Well, it was, it was like a myriad of things coming together just right. So obviously I was obsessed with pool and basically did that 24 seven aside from selling art. Um, what happened was I was playing some tournaments to get to meet some of the pool players, but I really didn't care about the tournaments. I was there just to meet girls also because I was looking for someone to be one. I had written a movie. So I was looking for a specific look in a female pool player. Oh, wow. So hey. I didn't care. A, a some of those girls, huh? A, sorry, a film script about playing yes, pool? Or? Movie, and that's actually why I was playing tournaments with these female players. I was actually looking for a lead and I already had lined up. Uh, the pool hall hard times to be part of it and all this other stuff but none of them knew that the funniest part is when i found the girl she turned on me and a lot of those girls turned on me and they were quite mean and they wrote a lot of bad stuff about me online and that kind of created this energy against me and then it turned the other way because i already had some videos of me doing trick shots on youtube and i had some martial arts videos which i've taken down since <laughs> but uh that energy they created in trying to destroy me actually completely backfired because I had a lot more skills and people started actually offering me money to do trick shot exhibitions and appearances. And so I took it. I saw an opportunity. I started, and I also started doing exhibitions with some of the best players in the world, so like Efren Reyes and Francisco Bustamante. The best players in the world started talking to me again, you know, and so they put me up there accidentally and I just kept going so I just saw the opportunity and the people wanted to help me and 
about a year or two later, I moved to Texas to do a documentary. Mm. And then I did the DVDs and we sold about, I don't know, 50,000 of those DVDs. Wow, so, that's incredible. So that was 2013. So it was more like all these things came together and I just took advantage of it. Talking about taking advantage and the, the things you've done, like sell merchandise, sign memorabilia. You mentioned mm-hmm. the, the high sales of the, the DVDs. Oh, yes, I miss those. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I wanted to talk about teaching, education and mentoring students mm-hmm. who, like, who, like yourself, share a, a love of the game. What do you enjoy most about teaching students and sharing your skills and talent? And have any of your students gone on to the professional circuit and earn a living from the game like yourself? So here in the United States, most people that take lessons are uh, league players. They will never be pros, but they love the game. Their love is very, very pure. And most of my students that come from that world, they're the captains of their team. And so what I teach them, they teach to their everyone around them. So it spreads beautifully. So I love that. I love the give and take. So what I'm doing is making them better and it makes everyone better around them. Now for the pros, I actually have worked with many pros. And when it comes to nine ball, many of them play better than I do. But so I actually coach other pros There's very few true coaches in billiards, at least on this side of the pond. In England, I know there's a lot more snooker coaches, but here in the United States, there's not as many billiard teaching pros. And if they are, they're not usually as good, to be honest. So I get a lot of work from pros coming to me. Uh, Interestingly, snooker's um, a huge game in the the UK. It was particularly Mm -hmm. big during the sort of period of the, the 1980s. And I kind of always associate snooker very much with, with, with England, although there is a, a huge tournament in China, but how is snooker as a game perceived in America? Um, and is it a game that you follow on television and, and play yourself? So snooker in the United States is kind of like soccer. People know it's big in Europe, but in, you know, the average American does not follow snooker. And if they ever did play it, they usually don't like it because it's too hard. So snooker is significantly harder. The average American plays, if they do play pool, they play on a bar box, which is only seven feet by three and a half mm-hmm. with easy pockets. And then the league players, they play on a harder table, but it's still at best a nine foot. So they just really don't connect with snooker. Now, there is a secondary group of Americans who are first generation Americans. So they were born abroad. They love snooker. So almost everything snooker related in the United States is driven by people that are first generation Americans. So for example, I drive to Houston to train quite often. And that's four hours away from me, by the way. It's and everyone at those pool halls, on one pool hall, they're, you know, they're from Hong Kong. And another pool hall, they're from Pakistani, India. So even though these are Americans, they're oh, originally they were foreign born. So the pool scene in the United States is very much them and all the little pool halls in general that have 12 footers at least. Now, there has been a long history of 10 foots in the United States. That was actually very common before my time, but slowly they've all disappeared. And I was very fortunate to go to one of those where I learned where I clocked those 10 by five money games. Those people that I was playing money with, they've been playing their own version of snooker on a 10 by five since cowboy days. So it's a very old tradition in that town, but it's very unique. It is not a very common thing in the United States. I'm aware that you're a a snooker fan yourself and You've played the, the game on many occasions and on your YouTube channel, there's various videos of you playing at a, a snooker table. Have you ever considered joining the UK snooker tour or maybe playing, making the transition to snooker at a professional level? 
I was actually in the process of doing that this year. And then the Women's Professional Pool Association here asked me to join them. So actually, I was, I was practicing quite a bit on 12-footers, you know, because my game was on 10-foot. I'm switching to 12-foot. And then I got a call, you know, I got a call from them. And I'm like, damn it, I haven't been playing nine ball at all. <laughs> so that actually happened to me this year. But I'm still going to play. They're having a very first real snooker tournament in Seattle. Mm. And I'm actually still going to play that in August. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to overlap. And I do plan eventually to go to England and play snooker and in Italy, obviously. So I do plan to switch over eventually and do both. So we may at some stage, Mary, see you on the, the snooker scene. I wanted to ask you a, a career a question, sorry, about your career and your ach achievements. When you look back at your career, what would you highlight as your most memorable experiences and why? You know, my most memorable experiences were when at the beginning, because everything was so new, meeting, becoming part of the Filipino group when I was a child with Efren Bustamante. That was probably the, the sweet moments. And then the second most sweetest moments were probably just me playing for money. There's something pure about just playing for money. There's nobody watching except you, that group. And just pure sport, pure, you know, hard, none of this, none, you know. I know it seems weird, but because I live off my fans, I've, I have over 400,000 followers. You know, the only two people that have more followers than me are Ronnie O'Sullivan and Benham. And, but honestly, I miss the moments where nobody knew who I was really. And I was just me beating some poor bastard out of his money. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of wanted to pick up on the, the gambling side or hustling, I, I guess which you kind of <laughs> mentioned earlier on, is, is gambling something that always kind of fascinated you in any ways? And were you sort of maybe a, a poker player or did you kind of visit casinos, or, you know, at a certain time in your life? And I kind of wanted to talk about the, the hustling side of pool. What is it that kind of turns you on and motivates you to, to do that? The... Well... To be fair, I I never hustled. Hustle means something different. Sure. I did play for money. Playing for money has a purity because it's just you and somebody else. And there's no excuses. There's no, you know, it's just you and them. It's very pure and winner take all. There's some purity to that. But I did grow up. My stepdad was a very a degenerate gambler, really. So <laughs> what is it we can pour when, we're, when I was a child, about 10 years old, is because he lost everything gambling. So <laughs> yes, I grew up playing poker. I made money playing poker. So to me, playing for money doesn't affect me as much as it affects other people, I think. So it definitely gave me an edge. That and I almost died when I was a child. So I don't, I don't feel the same emotion. So for me, it's more it's a lot more pure. It's more a competition thing, you know, just very pure. Can you record the most amount of money that you've played for? It wasn't really that much because yeah. one, I'm younger and there's just not as much money games as they used to. And also most money games require to get a high enough game require you to either give weight nowadays or to trick people. And I don't like doing either one of those. I haven't played a handicap tournament since 2013, 12 actually. And I have never hustled, which is the true essence of, you know, that's where you can make the most money. And also one reason I'm always honest with people and that would require, you know, laying down and pretending and a bunch of stuff that I don't do. If I'm playing well, good. If I'm not, you when you lose, you'll be fine. You know, to me, it's not as, complicated the obvious question to ask anyone who's successful in their profession is to ask them who they would cite as their influences and, and why who do you admire on the current billiard scene and which players would you say have been your toughest opponents 
Well, I don't want, so obviously first snooker, I would pick Ronnie O'Sullivan because, and I'm picking purely selfishly because I shoot very much like him. So it's, it helps me to think that way. But for pool, I would pick my friend. And again, I'm being biased because he's literally my friend. I grew up with him, although he's already a grown up when I met him, you know, Efren Reyes. But I would pick them too. You know, and if I was going to pick the toughest opponent, I'll pick them again. <laughs> that's where I want to be. <laughs> interesting choice with O'Sullivan, the rocket, who continues to kind of break all the, the records and seven world championships now to equal Stephen Hendry, who held the record back in the, the 90s. But obviously a, a, a natural-born sports personality, also, you know, very much um, a dedication and passion to the sport, but also somebody naturally talented. Would you say that you're a natural entertainer? And when you play pool, do you like to, you know, entertain the crowds, not just necessarily with your play at the table, but with your personality? And also maybe the fact that you're a female player as well. Is it a kind of a mixture of kind of assets that you can bring to the game? Well, the truth is I don't do it on purpose. It just happens. People are entertained by me a lot more than they are watching the average pool player. Obviously my appearance is a factor. My gender is a factor, but the real factor is that I'm a very aggressive player. So that's very entertaining because most pool players and snooker players that are great are not necessarily very aggressive. So their game is a little duller. You know, I do masses a lot. I kick a lot of balls. I do a lot of combinations. So my game is just more interesting on average. So it's all of those things come together. But honestly, I don't think about it much. People tell me they like it and that's good, but really I do it for myself. You just, you just do it. You don't think about it. It's just a question well, of, yeah, yeah, like a lot of yeah, things. You know, like, if I want to shoot left-handed, I shoot a left hand. If I shoot a one-handed, I shoot a one-handed. I don't care. Why not? I'm not thinking. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about professional female billiard players on the, the current tour because you mentioned earlier on in our conversation about, you know, during your early years, some animosity and, and difficulties with kind of fellow female professionals. Which female um, players do you admire the most and why? And how do you think female billiard players are perceived in today's world? So I like to make clear the girls that, that attacked me at the beginning, they are not pro level. Part of the reason they're bitter and unhappy, as people have told me, is because they, they could never get there. A lot of that stuff doesn't exist at the high level now that I'm in the WBA. There's much less of that because you're too busy doing your own game. And it's so much harder that there's no time for that. Now, um, how the United States sees female pool players is very complicated. A lot of people really admire us for what we do. And there's also a lot of hardcore pool players, mostly male, who look down upon us for completely arbitrary reasons. And there's not much you can do about them, but you can definitely, the other side is wonderful. So the majority of people are really respectful, really nice. And the moment they know you're a professional player, super wonderful. And outside of the States, it's mostly wonderful. I get fan mail from all over the world. The Philippines is wonderful. Almost every story about me has been done by Filipino pool players. I mean, uh, journalist. So, for example, so that overall, outside United States is completely, almost completely positive. I wanted to pick up on your your business acronyms because you spoke very openly about your interest in in business, and you mentioned early on about being mentored by your stepdad. He was a very shrewd businessman. Do you have plans to grow your profile and your business? And do you have any ambitions or goals that you want to achieve in the sport? And are there any major tournaments you would like to win? 
well, I just joined the WPVA, so I need to, I've only had, it's my rookie year. I've only played two tournaments and they have not been stellar. <laughs> uh, frankly, I've been ignoring Nambo because I was going to start playing snooker. So that was not helpful, but I do plan on winning some of those. There's a lot of classics, like the one I just played, the Ashton Twins Classic. That would be a nice notch on my belt. And, you know, I'm very young. Most of the, most pros don't peak this early on, with male or female. So the average person I'm playing that can really give me a game is more like 50. So, you know, I have a lot of time, but yes, I plan on winning a lot of titles. You know, it's just win. <laughs> You know, so um, well, yeah, it's uh, one of the things that's great about pool and also makes pool or snooker much harder. You know, all the pocket games is that people don't get injured out like they do in basketball or football. So, you know, if you're playing basketball, you're not playing Michael Jordan. But in snooker and pool, you are. You When I open an open tournament, which... That's all I was doing before I joined the WBA. I was playing with everybody. And there's like three Michael Jordans in the room. And you have to beat those guys. <laughs> so it makes it a lot tougher because you have, to, you have to play so much better than you would have to in other sports to get to the same level. Because those guys are still there. You know, people are, don't stop playing until their eyesight goes. I wanted to... <laughs> talk about competition tournaments and prize money because here in the the uk for many decades the the prize money in major tournament snooker has been particularly high it's been sponsored by many corporate well-known brands and mm -hmm. obviously the players that win those tournaments get in endorsements and go on to you know very fine careers if they can, can carry on winning is the tournament prize money high in um, in the pool world? And what kind of money are we looking at to win, say, one of the major tournaments? And how many big tournaments are there over the course of the year? There are many, but the money is very low. Honestly, the reason I make money is because of my other, and also I have backers. So when I show up at a tournament, I already got paid. So I'm an exception. Most pool players don't have that. So they don't have endorsements, they don't have products, they don't have backers. And if they, and if they have sponsors, they're merely getting products. So they, they don't have the, the support that I've created for myself with a lot of help. So, you know, I have a lot of wonderful people behind me and it took me a long time to create that. It's one reason I was not playing tournaments. I actually only started playing tournaments right before COVID hit because I was going to start playing tournaments in China of all places because there was real price money and regular pool in China. And then COVID hit. And then people saw me play tournaments and it got really, really excited. And again, that snowballed and I took advantage of it. And that's why I'm actually playing tournaments again. So I actually had, I had underestimated how excited my followers and friends and everybody was on be just playing a tournament. You know, you just mentioned you had a supportive team behind yeah. you. I wanted to ask, do you have a manager and do you have people responsible for your bookings, your, your travel, booking you into tournaments, updating your website, selling your products? Can you kind of just explain, you know, how many people are involved in the sort of Mary Avena business and the Mary Avina team, how does that kind of all function yes, day but, to day? Well, if you count followers, it's 400,000. Wow. <laughs> but everybody that's a little bit, there's no one central figure. If, you know, every little bit helps them together adds up to a lot. But I do have specific agents for certain areas for. So in appearances, for example, I have an agent in New Orleans that gets me very good jobs at corporate events. So for those kind of things, I do have agents that have their own region they control. So I do a lot of appearances and trick shot exhibitions and those pay really, really well, you know, compared to regular pool. So, and then um, I actually shut down most of my sales of products during COVID 
I plan on reopening that next year. So the team is fairly large, but most people are doing very little, a little piece here and there. You know, I don't have as much centralized. And that's one of the things I do plan on working on within the next few years, make a more concise team. Mary, I want to talk about life outside of billiards. And I know that's going to be difficult because I know it's played <laughs> such a key role in your life and it's everything you've kind of dedicated and it's your kind of true one passion in life. But outside of your professional life, you're also a, a certified martial arts instruct, instructor. You're a keen artist and you've displayed and sold your work at exhibitions. Can you discuss uh, your interest in these areas and things you enjoy doing away from your professional life? Well, martial arts was a very strong part of my childhood because I was not attracted to it in the normal sense. I was actually did out of a necessity because the area where I lived was quite full of crime and I experienced some violence when I was a child. So I did it to protect myself. Now my uh, autism and my Asperger's took over and I became obsessed and I became a master at 14. So, but that's my, my mind works that way. I go full in and whatever I do. So I did that to protect myself mainly. So nowadays I'm a second degree black belt instructor, but I really don't enjoy that because basically I learned to hurt people. And I use it mostly as a tool. It keeps me safe. So I can do that if I have to, but in general, I don't try to live there. Now my, my art, that's just part of me. It was I was born with it as part of my genetics. You know, my, my biological father being a gifted artist and himself and being a gold jeweler and his family, a long line of gold jewelers. So, I'm actually the first person that I know of in my family that has the gift of gold jewelry making, who doesn't make a living from it, from that line. So for me, it's, they're beautiful. Art is beautiful, but it's not fulfilling for the same reason of a lot of things that I don't do too much because it's actually too easy. There's, I get into flow of it and I can do close to anything and it's not challenging enough, if that makes any sense. We can see all the items in the, the background, which are obviously related to your professional billiard career. We can see you obviously sat at the, the pool table. We can see pool cues, balls in the background and so on, but also hung on the wall, we can see some instruments. And you mentioned before we started recording the interview that you took up playing musical instruments, guitar and bass during the pandemic. Can you talk a little bit about your, your love of music and what made you decide to pick up an instrument and learn how to play? Well, COVID was hard on all of us. I went from traveling quite a bit and giving lessons quite a lot to being home for months till you know, my students broke down and started inviting me to their houses. So I just started giving drinking wine at their house, but <laughs> they're nice mansions by the lake. But you did better. <laughs> yes, it was awful. <laughs> but <laughs> I took off music because it was difficult. I do not have an ear for music. It does not come naturally. And I'm not great. But there's a beautiful challenge in that for me. And it's also practical, too. There's a practical side to it. I put that in a lot of my videos lately in because of my views get over, usually on, on Facebook, they go over 100,000 views. So as a result, lots of people have already heard me play. So I'm one of the best heard amateur guitarists in the world. <laughs> Who knows, maybe a, a new career as a, a musician. <laughs> Who knows? Um, I wanted to ask you one final question and we kind of move on then to the final questions that we ask every single Your Take guest the final 13 questions. So we'll move Ooh. on to that in just a minute as our kind of finale for this evening's <laughs> interview. But I've kind of asked this 
a little bit earlier on in the interview, but how do you look back at your life and career as a professional billiards player? How supportive would you say your family has been for fulfilling your dream and your journey? And how do you think you're perceived by your fellow professionals and also by your large fan base? So my family was pretty awful at the beginning. They did not understand what I was doing. My stepdad and my mom, they believed that I was doing something very sketchy. What I was actually doing was more like an obsession, athletic endeavor, and all the other stuff around it was not even on my perimeter. You know. Now my my fellow professionals are mixed bag. <laughs> Most of them are very confused by the fact that I do so well because the average professional pool player puts all their eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. So the average, at least here in the United States, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about the whole world. Here in the United States, the average good pool player basically is good at one thing and most, for most of them it's nine ball. And so their, their whole goal is there in winning tournaments. And they don't understand someone like me because I'm good at, I master eight ball when I was a kid. I did, I do trick shots at a very high level and I get lots of falling from that. I also play snooker and I, I get a lot of falls from that. And also the business side and the products. They're actually very confused in the fan base. They're very confused of how I achieve any of those things because they're so focused on one avenue. So I mostly confuse them. <laughs> so their, their thoughts are all over the place because what I'm doing is so foreign and complicated from their point of view. Now my fans just love whatever I put out. They are, they just, they see the positivity and the fun and I have a lot of teaching videos. I have a lot of fun videos. I do holiday videos, all involving billiards. They're just happy to be there for the ride. They're not thinking because pool is not how they make a living. They're thinking just from the entertainment value. And I work really hard to create value in my videos whether it's entertainment or teaching so they're very happy <laughs> interestingly you say you have this kind of huge fan base that love kind of following your life what you do day to day have you ever thought about using that kind of social media tool and almost doing some sort of fly on the wall documentary or or something you know around your life and you know, that's kind of maybe more revealing about you as a personality and kind of, I don't know, using that tool in some sort of way to, to document your life, what you do day to day, your dedication, what it takes to become a professional player. There's been talks, um, different groups have approached me, television mostly, to do documentaries on me. But, you know, in general, I've push back on some of that because I do enjoy having a life outside of pool like so part of me has pushed back on becoming more mainstream so right now people that know me they know me from pool stuff like that could cross over into where regular people would know who I am so I have pushed back a little just like when I was a child and I got offered to be a travel channel girl I got I so there I do have apprehension you know, now if it's completely pool related, I've been up for several TV shows and they ended up never getting made. <laughs> I've actually talked to Netflix. Um, anyways, I've talked to other people and I would probably do a TV show that was pool related, but a show just about me, I would have to rethink myself a little on that. I'm not sure I'm ready for that. Maybe when I get older, you know, maybe when I accomplish a lot more, but right now I feel like maybe it's too early. You know, I'm not even 30 yet, so. Mary Avina, it's that time. These are the 13 quickfire <laughs> questions that we've asked every single Your Take guest. Kind of find out things that we've maybe not picked up on in tonight's conversation and find out a little bit more about you, maybe mm -hmm. things that you're not so keen on. So here they are. I don't have to think about these in any kind of great detail. Number one, Mary. What would you say is your favorite pastime? Eating. Eating is my eating is my only true hobby. 
I, I, me a... <laughs> I thought straight away we were going to say pool. What? No, pool is a, it's my passion and my job, but it's not a true hobby. You know, eating is my only true hobby. <laughs> if you like eating, how do you say stay so slim? Um, I mostly eat once a day, so that yeah. way I get to have a giant meal. I, I like it. I like eating, but staying slim, I, I do struggle with, I got to be honest. Um, we move on to, to film, and you did mention about writing a screenplay. I'm interested to find out what is your favorite film and why? It's very easy, Groundhog Day. That, it's because that's what my life feels like a lot of the time, especially when I'm on the road. I'm on the, I used to be on the road a lot more when I used to make a lot less money, I had to be on the road a lot more often. And when I meet with people, they most people actually end up asking me the same questions. And when I play pool with them, I see the same things over and over again. So from my point of view, everything is the same, but from their point of view, it's completely new. So my life for a long time was exactly like Groundhog Day. <laughs> the desire to make a film about the, the pool scene or a pool player. Are there any films that have kind of tackled the, the game that you're particularly fond of? Well, I like, see, it's a complicated question for me because I read the books. Yeah. So for example, I like The Hustler, but The Hustler is a much better book than a movie. I, do you know what? I, I love the movie. I think the movie's tremendous with, yeah. um, Paul Newman, the great Paul Newman, is, is it Fast Eddie? Yes, it's a fantastic movie, but I think if they would have been pure and did it more like the book, it would have been even better. And again, that's just my opinion as a movie critic. <laughs> and then, of course, there was the, the sequel many years later, The Color of Money, with a, a very young Tom Cruise and Newman again, who won the Oscar. We move on to, to novels, and you've mentioned your love of the Hustler novel, but who would you say is your favourite novelist? You know, it's... I don't have a favourite novelist because I do not favour novels. Hmm. So I, my favourite category of book is self-help. So I need, I'm more of a practical person, so it's more like a myriad of self-help. You've done a number of different things, and we've established that over the course of the last hour, but... If you could have had a different profession, what would it have been? Well, obviously the best fit for me naturally is to be an artist, you know, and family tree wise to be, to be a gold jeweler. But, well, I would be great at those things. Um, I probably wouldn't have ended up picking those. I probably would have just picked something else that was really hard for me, at least at the beginning, like pool was. And it just depends on luck. I could have walked into something else. For example, when I was a kid, I got offered to be a golfer, a professional golfer, because I, I was tall and I could hit the ball super far. And I was already, you know, it's a big deal. So people were trying to coach you free and I couldn't do it because I have bad, I have bad, my skin is very sensitive to the sun. So some of that is just luck. I'm sure if I had slightly better skin, we wouldn't be talking right now because I'd be on some golf channel. Yeah, talking golf. <laughs> It, yeah. Interestingly, you mentioned your love of food. Has there mm -hmm. ever been a desire to be a cook or a professional chef? I could do that, but I don't think my practical side would let me. I do cook fantastically well. Since I was a kid, I took over my holiday dinners. So I've been cooking the holiday dinners for my family since I was, you know, like 13. So I am that good of a cook, but... I probably would have not picked it for a practical reason. It's just very hard to make a living from that unless you open your own restaurant, you know. <laughs> Next, I, I wanted to ask you, who has been your greatest inspiration in life? You know, I don't have a single person that way. I picked this up from a lot of my learning and book learning. When I think of inspiration, I think of a group of people that are very accomplished. And then whatever, when I face this difficulty or a key point in my life, I ask myself what they would do. And mm -hmm. someone from that group comes up and just tells me the answer. So most recently was Benjamin Franklin. 
what do you do when you face this situation? And they come up and tell you. It's one of those things you learn from self-help books. You know, just learn from the best and do what they would do. And most of the time it works very, very well. We ask all our guests to choose a paper, a newspaper that they read, mm -hmm. a daily newspaper. Do you read a newspaper? And if so, if so, which one is your preference? I do not read the newspaper because it has too much negativity and it takes away from my daily life. I got to focus on what I can control. And unfortunately, the United States and maybe the whole world has become very, they, everybody's pushing one side or the other. And I live in the middle. So to me, it's not very interesting. When we, when we talk about the press, mm -hmm. interestingly, in the, the sports columns, does Paul get much coverage in America or in certain states of America? No. In general, aside from the pool magazines or newspapers, whatever they are, pool does not get covered. I've been covered mostly by Filipinos. Most every article written on people is written by Filipinos because they're such hardcore pool players. And to them, it is a mainstream sport. So the United States pool mostly gets ignored, for example, even same thing for television, it works the same on television. I've been on television on the country channel, but I was there by myself, pool wise, I was the only person invited and people like me and the Black Widow and Ava Mataya, celebrity pool celebrities, we get invited on TV, but not pool itself. We're getting invited because what we've done and they're looking at us, but pool itself is not on TV like it used to be. And it goes the same for newspapers. Pool in the United States is falling out of the mainstream. And that's one of the things that I hope as I get older, a few years down the road, I hope to help with that. And that's actually why I wrote the movie, because that was one of my goals. Because one of the times when historically Pool, this all happened before my time, obviously, when Pool actually went up again was when you mentioned those two movies, Color Molly, The Hustler. During those times, Pool became mainstream again. So that's actually why I wrote a movie because that is one of my goals down the line. We come on full circle to food. What would you say <laughs> is your favorite food? It's probably a, a tie right now between pizza and Indian food. Obviously Indian food is <laughs> so good. The, the, the hotter the better or? However they make it, so yes. <laughs> However they eat it, you'll eat it. Um, Benjamin Franklin's name was uh, quoted slightly earlier. The, mm -hmm. the next question, we ask all our guests to choose a favorite cultural icon. Could be a political figure, could possibly be a, an inventor, someone from history, maybe someone in the, the mainstream, in the arts. Who would you choose? It goes back to the same answer. I just think of who's successful in their area. And that's who comes up to mind for me. You know, I just think of the subject and then someone in that area comes up. I always pick the pinnacle in whatever area they're in. Next, we talk about travel and holiday destinations. <laughs> what would you say is your favorite place or holiday destination? My favorite place is a place I have not been to. So for me, it's the, the nuance of it being new. Yeah, and then the next, second, the next good food and hotel. List. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We've spoken a little bit about music earlier on and playing bass and guitar during the <laughs> uh, pandemic and also using those for your, your YouTube videos. I wanted next to ask you, who is your favourite music artist and what would you say is your favourite album? Well, definitely... There's only one answer for me on that, Frank Sinatra. So Frank Sinatra is my favorite. Now, I don't, I don't have a favorite album. I do have a favorite category, and that's Christmas. <laughs> Christmas songs. Sinatra is an interesting choice because a huge icon in film, and he was he's a very good actor as well. He yes. made some um, big Hollywood films. He won the Oscar. I think for his performance in From Here to Eternity. Um, why Sinatra? I know he's a, a huge star in the 1940s. What is it about him 
as a singer, the voice, and also well, besides, as, a, as an icon. Yeah. Besides his music, his music is wonderful, obviously. It resonates a great deal with me because I also didn't come from the best background. And I identify a lot with his struggles. And we, all, we it sounds strange, we overlap in attitudes. I'm a lot more hard than I appear to be. And Frank Sinatra, you know, he did whatever he wanted and he made it work. You know, and I greatly admire that. Yeah, and I I think you're right. I think in business, we've spoken a lot about business. You have to have tenacity and you also have to be ruthless to some degree, particularly if you're employing lots of people. You have to, you know, have have a line. You have to have professionalism. You have to have a level of discipline as well. And I suppose in life, if you're prepared to be walked over, you're not going to be successful, are you, I guess? Yes. And that's a particular challenge, um, especially being female. A lot of people try to run me over and I just walk right by them. <laughs> just like Fran Sinatra would. <laughs> move on. <laughs> great answer. Um, we move on now to the last two. Firstly, Mary, what would you say is your greatest achievement to date? Well, it goes back to making a living from a game that no, everyone ridiculed me when I first started, when I said I was going to make a living from this, because pool, at least in the United States, is full of amazing players who can't make a dime. Mm. So my biggest accomplishment is making a living from billiards, because you know, especially because it was, it's so gratifying because everyone told me it couldn't be done. And I just laughed and walked right by them. <laughs> now we move on to the last question. We're going to pop the eight ball, I think it is. And Mary Avina, how do you wish to be remembered? That I did it my way. <laughs> Lovely answer. I think I'm going to go away from this interview this evening. I think the first thing I'll be typing into Google is Hollywood films or films that have portrayed the game of billiards, pool, or even snooker, because I can only think of two, which are the two we've mentioned. And I'm Mm -hmm. highly interested in your project, you know, your desire to make a feature film. And before we wrap our conversation, I wanted to ask, have you kind of written a finalized treatment or script? And has that been presented to anyone in television or in the film business? And how are you kind of pursuing that ambition to get a film made and will it ever be made? So I tried to make it, so it would have been hmm, 2011 or so. That's when I first wrote it and then I tried to have it made in 2013, but I got, I was trying to make it myself. So I was using it, I want to direct it. I don't want to give it to anyone else. That's a big part of it. So I wanted to be me directing it. That's why I was looking for the girl, a specific look in a woman. And I got turned down. My budget was, was very low, but movies are very risky. So I got turned down with the people that I asked. And then the girls turned on me and that, re- that really broke my feelings. Those girls really messed me up. So, because they, you know, when you get a frenzy and you get a lot of negativity, it broke my spirit. So I put the movie away for years and every once in a while I get up and I clean it up a little and make it better. And the irony is that a lot of the girls that turned on me would have been the stars of it. <laughs> So they actually hurt themselves the most because I will make the movie eventually. It's just a matter of when. So the the movie was actually filmed and it was, it was edited. It was in the production phase then, was it? Or no, I was, I couldn't move forward. I had a location to film most of it. I had some backing and then years later, I was trying to get a full backing for the whole money. So but I couldn't move forward because 
I wanted to have a real pool player actually doing the shots. Mm. And that was, turns out, very, very difficult to find a girl that met that look, very mainstream look that could actually play because pool is actually very difficult. <laughs> and there's not that many beautiful women that can play at such a high level. You know, it's just one of those things, you know, so it's... <laughs> Fingers crossed and we'll watch the space and hopefully maybe one day we'll, we, we will see a movie. I wanted to thank you for giving up the last 60 minutes of your time and being a guest on your take. It's been a little bit different because we've been quite a music led interview YouTube channel, I'd say. And I've certainly learned a lot today about Paul as a profession the exposure it gets in, in America and kind of maybe more importantly is kind of maybe been a little bit of a, a business lesson of how to earn a living from something that is a passion of yours. So thank you kindly for sharing your story. Lastly, how do we find out more about Mary Avina? How do we get in touch with you or see your YouTube videos or your website and yeah, just a bit of information on that, please. Just Google Mary Pooh Player. <laughs> it's all there. And the music? Oh watch, no. Watch the videos. <laughs> Finally, I hope to maybe see you one day in the UK, who knows, playing snooker exhibitions. Or who knows, maybe on the, I'll the play, play a tour. Yeah, I, yeah. I'll definitely come along. And lastly, I wish you all the very best for all your future endeavors. And thank you kindly again for being a guest on your take. It was wonderful. 